Actually, you know what? The Cubans down here, every one of them in their shops has an American flag. Every one of them yes, the flag. older Cubans are patriotic, rock-rib conservatives. The younger ones have been brainwashed by America. Children I teach, Dr. Savage, they are wonderful. They are patriots. They get it. They listen to their grandmothers and grandfathers about the Russian shoes and the guys being yanked out of their houses for saying the wrong thing and, and a chivato on every corner. They they get it. And the kids that I teach are wonderful. What do you what what, what do you teach, Michael? I teach mathematics. Oh, God bless you. Yep. Well, they don't make them like your father anymore. And, uh, hey, Michael, did you read that story of the cop from the Bronx, the detective, for 22 years, and what happened to him with that punk, the, the kid who shot someone in an elevator in the face? Yeah, and then, they, and then I want to know how he kicked out an MP3 player into the interrogation room. All right. Now, I talked about this last night at home, and you know what the smartest woman in the world told me? She said someone set that detective up inside the police station. In other words, if they frisked the punk after finding him, and it was a slam-dunk case, then they send the detective in. What was he, like a Serpico? He was one of these honest cops just doing his job, and the other guys in the department were on the take? Because they should have gotten that MP3 player out of his pocket. Absolutely. Mrs. S. is very insightful, Dr. Savage. Well, all right. So somebody set that cop up. But I want to say on this show, Michael, if they take the cop down and take away his pension, I'm going to make a contribution. I'm going to do a defense fund for him. We'll put it up on the website. I'll chip in. God bless, Michael. Thank Wait, you. Hold on. Michael, stay on the line. I want to send you a free copy of Psychological Nudity for yourself and your children and your, and your dad for the week. What a great caller that is. I'll be right back. Savage in the morning, Armstrong and Getty at night, Roger Hedgecock on the drive home, no problem. Personalize your radio. 910knew.com podcasts. <laughs> a few words about an important milestone that we've reached in Iraq. Today, American troops have transferred control of all Iraqi cities and towns to Iraq's government and security forces. And yay, the communists have won. The Obama Communist Party USA has won. And I want all you do-gooders listening to the show to tell me in as few words as possible what you think is going to happen in Iraq within the next Three months, six months, nine months in a year. The answer is Iran wins. And all of the men who died, all the men walking around with, without eyes, feet, or arms, will have lost their vision or their limbs for nothing. All because of you. Terrible, terrible story. Terrible story. The whole story is a nightmare from the beginning. The whole Iraq adventure was a nightmare. Bush 1 had it right. He went in and he didn't decimate the entire Iraqi military. And I said so right on the show. People, you, you remember, Bush 1 went in under Schwarzenegger. I, I'm sorry, under uh, Schwarzkopf. Pardon me, I mixed them up. He went in under Schwarzkopf. And if you remember correctly, in the first uh, Gulf War, Bush 1 and his team were so smart that instead of destroying Iraq and the Iraq military and Toto, they allowed the Republican Guard to survive and some of the military and the Air Force to survive because they were wise enough to understand that they were a counterforce to the Iranians. Bush, too, and the dummies surrounding him went in and did the exact opposite. They decimated the entire Iraqi military, so they thought. They took out the whole um, uh, guard, the Praetorian Guard, but they didn't. And as a result, there was a guerrilla war for five or six years. And the unintended consequences of it has been an unmitigated disaster for Iraq and the world, and most importantly for the United States of America. It is what bankrupted America. If you say, well, okay, it was Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac, I wouldn't disagree with you. It was Bonnie Frank forcing the banks to make loans to unqualified minorities and illegal immigrants. We know that. That's a given. But it was also the Iraq war. So we have mismanagement on both sides. Savage. Michael Savage. Afternoons 3 to 7. On Talk 910 KNEW. And online at 910KNEW.com. Coming up next, from San Fran Freak Show, The Savage Nation. 
from Talk 910 KNEW. The Savage Nation. It says a lot of things people have the boldness to say. Weekday afternoons, 3 to 7. Talk 910 KNEW. Warning. The Michael Savage Show contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Here is Michael Savage. Terrific show today because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. I suppose I'm such a success because my childhood was such a challenge. Uh, I received a very gracious call from Senator Coleman uh, a, a little while ago. Uh, he wished me well. I wished him well. My show, a horse's butt would be a better choice for a senator than this. Half-baked, rotten comedian. Al Franken now is a Democrat socialist giving the uh, Socialist Party USA a filibuster-proof majority, in case you didn't know that. And there we go again. So let's start this hour off on a high note. Let's play some music along the lines of what we had in the last hour. That's all. talking about the news of the day, like it matters. And then I was talking about I complain a lot, because that matters more to me than the news of the day sometimes. Cato the Elder, the Roman historian, wrote that the average Rome, turn it off, they can't do, I told you, they can't hear me. Cato the Elder, the ancient Roman historian who I knew personally, wrote to me personally the following. He said that in ancient Rome, the average Roman didn't care what the legions were doing in this country or that country, they didn't care what they were doing in uh, Italy or they were doing in Germany at the time or France. What the legions were doing was not that important to them. What mattered to the ancient Roman was the pebble in the shoe. What he meant was the day-to-day -day problems of being a citizen in ancient Rome. And in that regard, when I'm off the air, what matters to me, sure, I get steamed up over the news. But inevitably, I have to stop it because nobody wants to listen to it. They can't take it. They cannot. So if I go to a restaurant, which I do, unfortunately, more than I should, I mean, I love food, so what am I going to do? You can't cook every night. I, I have to move tables, or I go to a hotel I don't go anymore. I used to, when the kids were young, I'd move rooms. We were talking about that. And I asked you, do you mind me telling you about it? And I got such wonderful callers that really, I mean, they were great listening to. I could see why you like listening to me, because I'm not the only one who does this. I think that everybody would like to have the guts to do it, but they don't have the nerve to do it. It's not that they don't know that the table's bad or that the food stinks. It's that alone, it's not that they don't want to bother. They don't want to upset themselves and everyone around them, so they don't do it. It doesn't mean that you're a bad guy. But I think if, if more of us demanded better service, better food, I think there'd be less to complain about. I really do. I'll give you a little example, a minor example. Let's reduce it to the real Lilliputian level. Since I can do nothing about the Marxist Party USA under Obama. I can do a lot about which seat I have in a restaurant and what food I get, all right? Now, I don't go out of my way to make a trouble. I don't want trouble. I'll give you an example. There's a hole-in-the-wall Thai restaurant near where I live, a dump of the lowest order, but it's clean. The owner's a nice guy. I've watched his daughter grow up from the time she was a kid to college age. See, you know, a little a hole in the wall. I patronize it once a week, whatever. The food is actually very good. And when I go in there, it reminds me of being in the third world, which I like. It reminds me of my years as being a poor graduate student in Fiji. I sit in the back. It's got ugly mirrors like from a museum with palm trees in it. It's so retro bad that it's refreshing because they don't try to be what they're not. You know what I mean? There's no orchids on the table. It's like oil cloth with plastic. But him and his wife cooks, and he, and he has no personality whatsoever. One of the most personality-less owners I've ever seen in my life. He probably owns the entire shopping center. All right, so I go in there. I got tired of everything else. I go in there. 
I got into a like a tie jag. I went already twice in a row last week. So I, I said, oh, I'm going nuts. So the next day I figured I would be really wild and I order a takeout dish. That's after he knew me now. Every time I go and he says, someone wants to buy you a six pack of beer and I say to him, no, thank you. I don't need it. Blah, blah, blah. I go in there. I eat a good meal. The next night I don't want to go out. So I call up and I say, it's me. How you doing? I order a takeout dish. He cheats me again. It's half the size. So I started to steam up. I said, what's wrong with this man? When I'm in there, he says nice things to me, gives me a nice dish. He cannot help it. If you order takeout, you get half the size. You get half the size. One shrimp, two shrimp maximum, in a shrimp dish that costs ten ninety five. And if you order the chicken curry, it's about a, a piece and a half of chicken that uh, must cost him a nickel, if that much. So I said to myself, should I call this jerk and tell him? Or should I just let it go and not eat there anymore? And I said, wait a minute. I like the guy's food. I couldn't help myself. I call him up. And I say, hey, uh, Johnson, listen to me. 